Hey, everybody. Welcome back for season two of the Broken Banquet podcast. This season, we've got more interviews with missionaries around the world, more interviews with authors who have written amazing books about missions, and more conversations about what it means for us to abide with one another. And yes, probably a story or two about Ashley taking a walk, eating food, or having drinks with someone who she now loves. We're so glad you're back. We're glad to be back. And we hope that you will enjoy this episode. Hi, guys. <laughs> hey, Ashley. Hey, Will. How are you? You know, it, it. there's a lot going on right now. There's yeah. just a lot going on. Transitions are never easy. And I think we should have an episode about that soon, about transitions. Okay. Sure. Um, but yeah, I. you know, transitions are never easy. And there's just mm-hmm. a lot to do. And more importantly, I wish I had a money tree. That is my thought today. <laughs> Is I just wish I had a money tree in my backyard, mm-hmm. and um, I feel like that would make some of this transition time just a little bit easier. Well, I've been trying to be the sort of the one who keeps their eyes on the silver lining of the cloud, and as you go through this particular transition, saying things like, oh, Ashley, this is such a gift. Look at the time that you get to spend with these special people. And Ashley, look at the new things that are on there. So I'm I'm trying to be the annoying sort of positive voice on your right shoulder to counteract all of the stress and everything. I don't have a money tree to give you, unfortunately. Uh, If I did, I would. But um, I agree. I think I love about you is that you're so giving and generous that you would even give up your, your money tree for me. So I... I appreciate you. And I never once have wanted to punch you as far as all of that positivity that you've been throwing my way. I've appreciated the fact that you have brought my, that you've been my grounding force to bring me back to reality and to give me that silver lining positivity that gives me so much hope. I thank you, Will Bailey, for being a part of my life. Well, you're welcome. And I'm really glad to know that my being a part of your life has never driven you to physical violence. Thank um, you. <laughs> that's that's important to me. Um, so transitions and money trees aside, who's that sitting next to you today, Ashley? Oh, oh Will Bailey. <laughs> Have you been poking her in the arm? Because you, you have a tendency to poke me in the arm when I'm sitting next to you. I am now. She's so thankful. <laughs> we are sitting in the same room. Will Bailey, I'm so excited about the person sitting to my la- left and who is on your right. I do know my directions. Like if you're looking at the camera, she's on your right, right? No, but it's okay. It doesn't matter. So <laughs> Directionally challenged, which is great for transitions as well. Okay, here's the story. The year was 2013, Uh and in that year, I was in Haiti, and I was suffering from a bit of a parasite. I was not looking real great, not feeling real great, not just not healthy. You don't have to say any of that after you have said I was in Haiti, because all the rest of that is just understood. If if you were in Haiti, Ashley, you had a parasite, you didn't feel good, probably didn't look real good, but continue. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank you. It was a, it was definitely my story there for a few years. Nonetheless, uh, so I was in an airport thinking, I'm just wanting to go home. It was March 2013. I'm just going to go home for a while. And... There was this team, this great team of people. They were they were sitting over in the corner. I'd already broken in line in front of them uh, in trying to get my ticket changed. So there, it was a good first impression, I'm sure. Uh, and so the second impression was me laying down on, on a bench trying to just get to my flight, just wanting to be on the flight, maybe get home that day. And this wonderful doctor came over. Nice guy. He brought over one of the the pastors, the director of missions that was with them. They were so kind and so thoughtful. And they had been telling me about the medical missions that they had been doing that week. They were working at a children's home at Derivage, which is where I had a water system. So it was very good, good connections. 
And then I noticed that they're a group of people and there were a couple of, like I said, it was a medical team. And these people just looking at me and like covering their mouths going, you know, like, oh, look at her. Don't go over there. You know, I was in between them and the bathroom and they had to go around the lounge to get to the bathroom uh, so as not to come near me. I really did feel like the, the person on the road to Jericho. And so thankfully, my good Samaritan did come by. His name was Shane Barton. But that wonderful laughter that you hear, her name is Kay Ferguson. She never came over to check on me. And Will, Will, she is a nurse. Look, I had survived the week. <laughs> I didn't want to end on a bad note. It's looking very contagious. <laughs> Nikki had warned us of all the bad things we could come home with. <laughs> so, Will, it is my pleasure to introduce to our listeners, because you've met her a gazillion times. Mm -hmm. To our listeners, I introduce you to Kay Ferguson, the wonderful, <laughs> the nurse, the global mission committee chairperson at First Methodist Church of Shreveport. Hello, wonderful nurse, chairperson, Kay Ferguson. Well, I got to say, the energy level already, even though you haven't spoken yet, I can just tell, like, Ashley is as energetic as I've, as I've seen her, and I'm pretty sure I know why. It's because you are in close proximity. And I just want to say really quickly, Ashley, I've heard you tell that story a number of times. You've told it a number of times on this podcast, but it's interesting to me to hear it. It's almost like one of those movies that it's sort of the same story over and over again, but from some different person's perspective. So you see sort of scenes that overlap because yeah. depending on who you're talking to when you tell that story, yes. the perspective of that story changes a little bit. And who the bad guy is in that story. That's what I was going to say. I wasn't expecting Kay to get thrown under the bus in this version <laughs> of that story. Uh, but I think at this point, all of us can pretty much visualize what that airport experience was like for you. So um, anyway, Kay, welcome to the Broken Banquet Podcast. And thank you. I'm actually excited to be here. Well, we wanted to have you on because I think your story and my story are so closely intertwined, Yes, um, especially over these last 10 years, that I couldn't have been who I have been without you. Oh, wow. And, and I wanted everyone to be a part of the journey that you and I went on together. Yes. Because I think you and I, for this last 10 years, we've grown together mm -hmm. every, and we failed together. Yes. We've had great successes together. And so I think that I couldn't be who I am without you. And so it was a perfect partnership from the beginning, despite that. Despite goal, that. March 2013. Despite incident. that. And it has it has merged us into um, the best of friends. Yes. You know, that is true. It has. So I'll tell you, Kay, one of the things that, that I appreciate is that from from the very first conversation that Ashley and I had once she got to Shreveport, she started mentioning leaders at the church, people who were involved in missions that, that we were going to get to know. And the consistency over the last 10 years of the names of the people who are so committed to missions and these missional relationships has been, it's been incredible. And that's not always the case, you know, um, it's hard to get people to serve on committees and, and it's hard to get the same people to serve on the same committees and all that kinds of stuff. But the fact that you and, and several others have been so consistently involved in the vision that First Church Shreveport has for missions and for your relationships with us, with these missionary families, it just represents to me what the, the vision is. And it's the fact that it is about real, long-lasting, faithful friendships. Yes. And so... I can say as from the missionary point of view, and I'm just going to go out on a limb here and speak for all of us, but it just means a lot to us that we know you and we know that you know us. And that comes from this, this long-term commitment that you've made. It's not just, I'm a church member. I'm expected to be on a committee this year. Okay. It's missions next year. Okay. It'll be finance next year. Okay, fine, Pastor Parish or whatever. Um, but the fact that, and, and I know that this isn't the only thing that you do at the church is 
be involved with with missions but in in the midst of all the stuff that you all are involved in you always make time for us and it just really that's a huge gift that that you personally and and those like you at the church have given to to me and to our family so thank you for that well and you know i never thought about it that way with our committee but honestly as far as a global mission committee we're really like a committee mm-hmm. Like the title committee is like on paper, but you ask any one of us who have been in this for a number of years and we're a mission family and that's what we call ourselves. And so we here at First Methodist, our group, we are a mission family, but then we're also, all of you are part of that mission family. And so, yeah, I never, I I really don't think of it as even serving on a committee because just like you said, I've served on various committees. Yep. Okay. This, that terms up, let's serve on the next one. I've done all that. And this has been, this is a totally different experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mission family. family. When we have our meetings, we don't, we don't sit in a room. Like we, we're in Ashley's home. Usually we're around a table with food and fellowship. And that's what a global missions meeting looks like. So Ashley, I want to interview you just for a second. Yes. Um, My guess is it's very satisfying for you as the missions pastor. Ashley, I know you, know you probably wouldn't take credit for kind of creating that, but watching that happen, you know, maybe at first it was a committee meeting and now it's family. What is that? Is that something that you feel like you were intentional about? Is that something that you just see as one of the fruits of people getting it? Like what? At, have you even thought about it? Is this something that you realize like, hey, this is kind of different than the finance committee? Um, do you know what I mean? That's a great That's question, a Will. Question. That's a really, really good question. I think because we started out as a very small group of people and we were all very like-minded and we had all been given the same goal or something to achieve together. So we had been given that that vision by our senior pastor. So we knew what we were working with. And because I had started a doctorate at the same time, I felt like we were all in this learning group together. And we agreed pretty early on that things had to be undergirded in prayer. And we just really liked each other and clicked. And so I think that it became this natural intertwining of like-minded people with the same vision and all working toward that vision together. And it very quickly went from this is our ministry opportunity or this is our job to we get to do this together as a body of Christ and learn our way through it together. And so I feel like we've all just been on this journey together, which has created this family. And I'll ask Kay in a second, because I think that there was definitely transitions throughout this time. So from 10 years working, there were definitely transitions of where we started and a definite kind of benchmark in the middle. Yeah, can I just speak to that question too? I know that was a question for Ashley, but I think part of once we did, you know, come together as a group and we did, we we clicked like-minded people, but then we all started traveling on these trips with Ashley, not all together. None of the whole group has never been on a trip together, all of us, but we've all been on trips, some to the same places and some not. I've not been to all of our country. No one on our committee, I don't think, has been to every single country. And so once we started traveling, then we all brought something. We all brought our experiences to the table. And so then those discussions, we were learning from each other, learning more about you guys, all of our mission partners from each other as we started traveling and experiencing. So I think that uh, that helps make us a family too. So what you're saying basically is that finance committee meetings would be a lot different if they would take more trips together. See, absolutely. There you go. Yep. (laughs) Well, uh, what I think is interesting about that part, Kay, is then how that sort of spun out into changing the idea of a mission trip at First Methodist to now it's not, oh, we're having a party. Look at this. Um, (laughs) It's... (laughs) 
Listeners, uh, confetti, virtual confetti just fell all over my office um, because of some sort of gesture that I made. Anyway, the way that, that that sort of spun out into redefining what mission trips meant for the church and what their expectation of mission trips were. So because the committee was having these experiences of traveling to get to know these missionary families— it was, I guess, easier to start getting church members who aren't on the committee excited about doing that same thing, which has grown now into this even larger community beyond the committee who also have experienced that and been able to share in that that vision and then community. Because what I'm thinking of is in a church that your size, mm-hmm. uh, the more sort of ambassadors you have, the better. Yes. Because it's hard for you or for Ashley to sit down with all 5,000 members and talk about this. But if you've got, you know, a group of 10 and then a group of 20 and then a group of 40 who have all had these experiences and it's growing outward to me, it's just, if you can, it, it makes me wonder if one of the things that's so unique about how we feel when we come to visit your church and the way that people feel like they know my family comes the the seeds for that start in that committee relationship and and what it means to that committee and i think there's a connection there and i can tell you one of the biggest compliments to us as a mission family committee <laughs> yes love it is when when you guys come and i mean different missionary partners when you come to our church and you say your church members already know us. Like, that's like, bam, we're doing something right. Praise God. Praise God. Check. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. Yeah. I brag about you guys a lot because of that, that it's one of the only churches that we've ever visited that I don't ever have to introduce myself to anybody while we're there because everybody already knows who we are. And it's kind of, it was kind of creepy at first. Um, <laughs> the first time we came, I was like, wait a minute. Do I, or it made me nervous. Like, oh, have we already met? How do you know? Did you, where did I meet? Did you come to Costa Rica and I've forgotten you? But but now I realize that it's no. It's because there's you know there's displays and devotional books and you know all kinds of stuff that we are in, and so they see us and feel like they get to know us that way, which is great. Yeah. Plus, if you travel with Ashley, when you get home, you're going to report back to the church, <laughs> which. In the beginning was a very kind of nerve wracking thing, but I grew to actually enjoy that because it 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 helps you process your experience. So you when you go on a mission trip with Ashley, you come back. I have written letters for our columns, which is our newsletter well, magazine that goes out every month. You or you speak to the congregation. I've been on the podium in traditional and you know faith link. Like we come back and intentionally though do tell our stories to the. 4,900, is it? 3,900. 3,900. You know, it's 5,000. <laughs> but the point being, yes, it does naturally, like you're talking about it, it kind of spreads, but we're also very intentional about trying to get it out there, you know, to the members in different um, avenues. I tell, actually, if people, if church members don't know what's going on in global missions at First Methodist, it's their fault. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, it's so much out there. I want to back us up. Yeah. Let's do a whole. And I want to tell this story through maybe Kay's eyes Mm -hmm. of what drew you to mission Mm -hmm. in the first place. And then the transition of maybe me coming in. Mm -hmm. And then we'll talk about how we got on that journey. And then maybe our point of where we're like, this is who we want to be. Mm -hmm. So do you want to do you want to start that? Yeah. Um, And. You know, I'll, I'll start the story. Um, it all starts with Haiti, and I'm going to go from there. And y'all just stop me if you want to stop along yeah. the way, and let's talk about something more. Because um, I can get started on this, and I can get real excited and real wordy. So I'll, I'll um, poke you. Poke me. I'll poke you. <laughs> for a pause. Um, I can't remember the very first moment in my life that I wanted to go on a mission trip, but I feel like that that little seed has always been there. Um, I grew up in church, but never, I never, the churches I grew up in, we weren't supporting missionaries directly. We didn't have relationships with missionaries. We weren't sending church members on missionary trips. So I never was in a church that I even had that opportunity. So 
being a member at First Methodist, like Ashley's already said, I'm a nurse. And I remember sitting in the Faith Link congregation when Ashley's predecessor, Nikki Sorensen, she announced to our Faith Link community that she was going to be leading a medical mission trip to Haiti. And it's like God poked me. It's like, okay, here's your chance. And it just lined up perfectly for me to not say that it was comfortable, but like, okay, I can do this. Mm -hmm. So I'll have a job to do. I can do this. Exactly. And so I knew right then I was going to do it. I had a two-year-old child at the time, didn't know how I was going to do it. But thankfully, thank you, God, my husband was on board. Family was on board. Now, there were plenty of people thought I was crazy leaving a two-year-old behind. But mamas, don't be scared. And don't let people convince you you're crazy. <laughs> anyway, so that's that's what got me there, okay? Um, prior to that, that was the very first medical mission trip that our church had done. Okay. Been supporting Haiti for, I can't remember how many years before that. So here we go. Shane Barton, who actually was brave enough to go touch Ashley in the Haiti airport. So um, we he was on board to be our doctor. He and Nikki really got everything organized. Okay, fast forward. We took all the supplies. Like we had to get the medicines. You know, we're talking any equipment we wanted, volunteers. So we we had to gather all of that, purchase it, pack it into suitcases. So anyway, so we go. And I mean, it was a great week. Medical mission trip. We basically you set up a medical clinic. And in any village in Haiti, if they hear the doctors coming, they will come. Bring the doctor. They will come. They will line up dressed in their best, they're coming. Um, so it was great. Plenty of work for us to do. But we also realized somewhere along the way, first of all, we're duplicating services. Yes, we're doing medical exams. We're handing out medications. Uh, we handed out eyeglasses. We gave the malaria, prophylactic pills. But then we realized, okay, other groups are coming and handing out medicines. Other groups are coming and handing out malaria pills, Oh, who's going to refill these medicines? Oh, who's going to check on them in a month if another medical team doesn't come? Because you can't, as a church, you can't support that ongoing. You can't be their sole supplier of, of you know, medicine and, and medical support. You know, those were some things that we realized along the way. And when Ashley came along and already had her, her background and her vision of the relationships okay, well, let's do this. Let's partner with a doctor in Haiti. Let's, let's support where the members of the, the, the residents of the orphanage, the members of that community, they can go and see this Haitian doctor that they have access to. He can follow up with them. There's continuity of care. Let's use our money not to haul medicine and supplies down there, but let's help put our money to something that's ongoing. Right. Yeah. The clinic that was the already cl operating. Yes. Yeah. There was a clinic there with a local doctor. Let's pour our resources into our financial resources mm -hmm. into that. That So that was the first shift in Haiti. Yeah. So now let's go to Haiti. Yeah. Sit with Nini and Monjurar. Let's go find out. Let's go get to know them. Let's get to know the Haitian culture. What do you, Nini, Monjurar, what do you need? Don't, we don't want to tell you what you need. How about you tell us what, you need. Mm -hmm. And oh man, that was a shift for me. Like that was like, okay. Well, and I think too, to put that in terms that we yeah. read about a lot is that we have this, we had this Western mindset mm -hmm. of we, we have the resources, we have the abilities, we have the professions, we have the people that can do all these things. So let's go give it to them without even listening and hearing their vision. And I remember Cindy Payne coming back and talking about that after one of her first trips. Of, they were just introducing me to their village and introducing yes. me to their people and introducing me to their vision of what this community was. And all of a sudden, it just became so much clearer to me that what I think about, it doesn't matter. I need to support what their vision is and support their leadership. And that was that yeah. was a big defining. Moment. Yeah, because whatever we bring there as Americans, they're not going to say no to, you know, it, it's and a cultural value. It's, it's a, yeah. yes, that, that, their culture. And so we, we're just wasting resources in the long run, because if we're bringing them things that they don't need, that they're not going to say no to was wasted resources. Mm -hmm. and, and part of this, part of this mission family and this, that 
it's very important to us too is accountability to our church and how we do spend the money that they're giving. Mm-hmm. Another thing in Haiti with Nimi, yeah. you know, with Nimi, who um, she and her husband together run Jerebiche Orphanage. Nimi got training in community health. Mm-hmm. Huge, you know, supporting that community um, healthcare wise. So it all began in Haiti. And that's where we realized. And so we, we trained we, once we made the transition in Haiti and then we had this vision that we needed to get out in the world and find mission partnerships, you know, and all the other, you know, continents that we you know could get into um here we go on our vision trips ashley and shawnee and i yeah. just the three of us to start with yeah so we took off and um some of these countries we knew immediately that we would partner with mm-hmm. some countries we knew immediately that we would not partner with some countries that we did partner with in the beginning we don't partner with now again relationships got to go both ways and relationships are hard and sometimes you got to break up mm-hmm. So it hasn't been perfect. It hasn't been perfect. And it I will say, perfect. I think that the ones that we try to force yes. are definitely the ones that failed and the ones that we let naturally, God naturally show us and uh, that we had relationships already that led us to something else, that that's, that's those are the ones that have had the longevity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as we started visiting missionaries in, in the countries, once we, we picked our partners and picked our countries, and then we start going to visit, because now we know we, we've shifted from transactional to transformational. So now we're going to go, let's learn what they do. Let's go learn. Let's go see firsthand what they do, what they need, how we can help, how we can support. Um, and it was fantastic. Um and in the very beginning, the church did not understand it, thought, you know, Ashley was going on how many vacations a year, yeah, like, they just, so you know, they just didn't get it. But for those of us going on those trips, but instant, we, we got it. We understood it. And Can I stop you there for a second? Because that was a question that I already had. I, I've heard I, Ashley talk about this from from her perspective before. But I'm I'm glad you brought that up. How difficult was it for you as a, a, a committee member, but also just as a layperson at the church, to get people to start accepting some of these different ideas? How much resistance did you, Kay, feel when you started talking to people about this sort of shift in, like you said, from transactional to transformational missions? Yeah, and for example, you know, when you go to Haiti, I think they, they kind of get it. Even even when we're not doing a medical mission trip anymore, but when we started going to other countries, I think it got tougher. So, you know, I went to, after that vision trip, like, I went to Romania. And yeah, they were to oh, well, well, what are you going to do? Or we got back, well, what did y'all do? You know, what was your mission? What was your project? The ones, again, the church members who are plugged in, who are following us, because we come back and we tell our stories, but we also bring back that missionary story. So we go to we go to Romania and we we're with with um, Stefania for the week. We come back with her story, too, and we put that out there as much as they can. So for the ones who are truly plugged in, they they got it first. Yeah. And I don't really know how long that took to start happening but the church at large, it just took us, not only us going, but I think it took our missionaries, once our missionaries started coming to visit us, and I'm going to talk a little bit more on that. I want to get more in detail about that. But I think when when all of you guys started visiting us and speaking to the church, I think that really helped them be more on board. And specifically talking about how it is that those visits matter, like why do those visits matter? And, and that was, I think that's been the click for things of how do you create a relationship? And if relationships truly matter, if we talk about that from the pulpit of the, of the uh, vertical relationship with God and the horizontal relationship with each other, if that's truly the most important thing that we do, then this is part of the relationship of bringing the body of Christ together across the world. And if that's truly our mission, then this is the most important thing is for us to be able to go and visit and be with you for a while. And it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Try and, to and, and, and part of my story's always been that until I started traveling with missions, I really did not fully understand what it meant to be part of the body of Christ. 
as simple as, like I said, once we started going to Haiti and sitting down with Nini and Montgerard and Franzu and um, Auntie, all the ones, we would sit around a table, eat food from the garden that they grew, that they prepared, and we would sit and fellowship and share our cultures. I started understanding then as I went to other countries and other cultures and and really spending time listening to these missionaries, I started understanding, okay, we are the body. This is this is the body of Christ. And it's so, that's just something that's hard to put into words. But Jessica Weaver in Czech Republic, you know, she told us, we started to go, started going to visit her. She told us no other supporting church, because we're not, you guys, we're not the only church that supports all of these missionaries that we support. Mm-hmm. But she told us we are the only supporting church that has ever come to visit her. And I was like, wow. And she told us, Stefania told us, you and Yolanda, Olga in Russia, all of them, you know, it's very consistent what it means to y'all for us team, not just Ashley, but for other team members to come and just visit. Even when when Stefania, when we first started supporting her in Romania, she wasn't 100% sure what her mission was going to be. Didn't matter. It didn't matter. We knew God put her there. We were supporting her. Now that her mission is all lined out, it's just been a beautiful thing that's fallen into place. But the other transition that happened with us is, you know, so we we get to know what the missionaries are doing and what they need. In visiting, we realize these missionaries are lonely. Yeah. And I don't remember which one of you, and it might have been you and Yolanda, you know, y'all were the first ones to say to us, who's ministering to us? Um, and especially hearing it from Yolanda, and maybe it was a woman to woman thing, but I'll join the party. Will I love Yolanda? Everyone <laughs> loves your wife. I mean, we love you, but man, you know, man, we love Yolanda. Man, we love Yolanda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having, having having y'all be there and and tell us that that was a, a huge like you know light bulb and, and transition moment for our team to hear and for us to realize how important it is for us to visit, not just to support what you're doing but to actually just be there with you and to minister to you, mm-hmm. pastor, you know, you and your family. And then y'all started coming to visit us more. All of our missionary partners have yeah. been to visit Shreveport. That's been huge for us as a global mission family mm-hmm. because y'all get to know us too. It's not, just, again, relationships are not one-sided. Right. And so to have y'all come and visit us and for us to get to know each other, it's just, it's been a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's just, it has, and it's, again, body of Christ, right? So I want to ask, though, on behalf of the 200-member church, who says, well, yeah, this sounds great. Let's let's send church members all over the world to scout out mission relationships, and then let's start bringing missionaries from all over the world to our church. Oh, wait. Yeah. We're a 200-member church. We don't do a printing or a a media department that prints devotional books that are going to have missionaries in front of the church member every month. Um, We don't print our own calendars that are going to have missionaries in front of the church members every month. We don't, um, you know, have a really nice modern display in the hallway on the way to our Sunday school classrooms where people are going to see our missionaries' faces every time they leave the sanctuary. So how do you translate this vision what if actually what if you were transitioning in the opposite direction mm-hmm. from Shreveport to a 200 member church in rural North Carolina yeah. how would you translate your vision for for ministry and the way that you've been able to bring it to life at Shreveport into that context well I started that's where I all started was at a rural church in North Carolina that had maybe 200 members and I would say that it's just a scaled down model if we really are about relationships then hopefully we pick one pick one just pick one missionary uh, mission partner whether it maybe it's a local person or maybe it's a local and global because I, I think that they both have to go together um, but be a presence in your community and be a presence in the world but pick the one and zoom is a wonderful thing these days you can cultivate a relationship at least the introductory and maybe you're not going to visit every year 
maybe you'll visit every other year, maybe once every three years. But and then that missionary is likely going to be back in the U.S. or come to the U.S. at some point. There's got to be there's some sort of if you make it a priority, it will happen. Um, And so if it's a priority, then you'll do it. And so you create that relationship, whether it be over Zoom. The missionary can uh, be on Zoom on a Sunday morning during Sunday school. Um, They can record videos these days on an iPhone. Uh, There are all sorts of ways, I think, that that the relationship can be instilled between the community and and the missionary or the mission project, for lack of a better word. So here's what I think. Yeah, go for it. I I think that it takes the same amount of effort regardless of the scale. Yes. And so if your church is willing to commit to the effort, Mm. regardless of what your annual budget is, but if you have people who think that this is an important part of what it means to be church and are willing to commit the amount of time and energy to it that you all do, then I think you can do it even on a much more scaled down level successfully. I think what you can't do in either situation is just kind of phone it in Mm -hmm. because the word that that comes to mind when I'm hearing the way both of you describe what it's been like at at your church is just how, how robust it, it takes a lot. You know, you couldn't, you, you could not have gotten to the same point where you are if you had only put in half the effort that you put into it. And I think that would be the same for a small rural church in Eastern North Carolina. If you've got folks who are as passionate about it as you all and your team are, then you're right. You can identify one partner somewhere in the world and you can make it happen so that someone from the church can go and visit that person and spend time with them and encourage them. And you can make it happen so that the next time that person is in the States, they can come and visit, but not if you're just kind of doing it, you know, there has to be a commitment, which is why I think one of the things that we've, we've tried to get across in the last two years of doing this is that it, it has to become a part of the DNA of the church. If it's just something that people do, then you really have a high risk of as soon as it gets hard or inconvenient or expensive, or what? There's a whole list of things that'll make people say, "Nah, oh well." But if it's become part of who you are as a church, then when you bump up against those things, you're going to figure out ways to make them happen anyway. Again, whether there's five thousand of you or two hundred of you. So, well, and I just want to add too, we're we're fortunate here, not just that we do have a you know a large mission budget, but having Ashley as a you know full time staff member. Us committee members, we don't have as many, you know, we, we, yes, visit when we can, visit y'all when you're here, but Ashley is in constant communication with all of our missionaries. You know, y'all talk daily, weekly, I mean, weekly, weekly, something, you know, weekly at least, and it might be telephone, it might be text, it might be Zoom, but it is, I mean, you got to, so I would think, even if you didn't have a full time, if we didn't have Ashley, we would have to divvy that up somehow. We would have to just make sure that someone from the church was in communication, not just when you visit them, but in, in communication, you know, consistently otherwise. Right. right. You're exactly right. Yeah. I think that that's a good point of if, who is the point person, because mm-hmm. there always needs to be a point person. Um, I was going to say, Will, you made me think of something about uh, us being a robust, a robust ministry here. And I do think that we are robust. I think that we also saw our limit that there were other people that we had identified that we would have loved to have brought into the global family, but we were at our limit Mm -hmm. as far as what we knew that we could support financially, but even more importantly, emotionally and spiritually and and time-wise. And so we knew that we had reached a point um, and that that was okay. When you're talking about that scaled down version or scaled up version to identify what that limit is so that you can still do it robustly and well. Good answer. Thanks. Yeah. I think we both interviewed today. This is really good. Okay. 
I think another thing that you mentioned too, Will, was the importance of education. And so even if you're in a smaller, smaller church, smaller setting, that education is vital key. And that's one thing that that when Michelle Osborne, who we've had here on the podcast before, uh, when Michelle Osborne and I were talking about what did the next 10 years of ministry look like, we noticed that we started off with a big bang. She and I came in together nearly at the same time. We started with a big educational campaign. We started with toxic charity and when helping hurts, we did a big push on educating the church together on what it looks like for this church to do local and global missions in a transformational way versus a transactional way. That's true. I forgot about that step because that yeah. y- y'all did a really good job of saying, hey, church, this is what's coming. Yeah. This yeah. is what's coming and this is how we're going to change our mindset and we're going to do this together. And and through that became all the educational materials of then how can you pray for these people? How can you support these people? How What does this look like? Um, and so I think that over time, We've just assumed that everyone in this church now knows that vision, but it's time for a refresher course. So when is it time again to start? We've got to kick off a new educational campaign to say, what's next, church? And so what's next for the next 10 years? And we met that first goal. Mm-hmm. So yeah, what's our next goal? What's the next goal? What's How do we continue education, the process, so that we don't fall back into the easy, easy mindset of what are you going to do? What projects are you doing? And to quote one of our favorite friends, we are human beings and not human doings. That's right. It's so true. It's so true. I, I wondered when you're thinking about this stage that you're that you're getting ready to kind of go through, it seems to me like you have a gold mine of resources available to you this time that you didn't ten years ago, which is the partners. You know, when you were starting this 10 years ago, you were starting with books and kind of the theoretical part and then reaching out, looking for partners. But now you have people like us who you can lean on and let us do some of that teaching and reminding the, you know, that's just, it seems like you have an extra tool in your belt this time that hopefully, I hope we would be effective in communicating how much this kind of relationship means to us and how vital it is to these different ministries all over the world. That's a really good point for the next, for the next transition of time. Like we have these great relationships across the world now. Why don't you all be a part of this teaching the congregation of here's what's really worked and here's why I appreciate it. And here is how you can continue doing this. And here are even other things that you can do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was invited to be a part of a a board of directors, uh, a missions board of directors. And the reason why I was invited was because they realized that none of the other 13 people on that board of directors were actually missionaries in the field. Mm -hmm. And, And they thought, you know, maybe it would be a good idea to have someone in the room who's in the mission field. And I think you guys, you know, you, you have a lot of people that you can bring into the room who are in the mission field, who can communicate these kinds of things. So I hope that you will. Yes. So Kay, if you could sum up the last 10 years in a couple of biggest lessons you've learned, let me put you on the spot. What would those couple of lessons be? Well, first the thing comes to mind and we've already touched on is that we don't always know what's best. I mean, we just don't, always know what's best for someone else. I mean, that's here or internationally. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I've really, I've really learned, like, just listen to people and get to know people, like get to know them, listen to them. That's important. Mm -hmm. And you were good at that before, but I think you're even better at it now. I hope I'm better at it now. And what I love too is that it's translated from the mission field to everyday life. And I think that that's what the big call that, Will, you and I have talked about a lot is we have these great experiences in the mission and listeners, I'm doing the whole like quotation marks in the mission field. We have these experiences, but if they're not translating to our everyday lives, then there really isn't transformation. So how is it that we can have these experiences, understand our partners and then have it affect us so much that we are transformed into everyday living from that point on. 
you know, and, and I just, through the traveling, I just brought so many things back to my family and especially to my son, Joseph. I still pray that he'll, that we'll take a trip together one day, but you know, just, it just as a mother, like when we visited Ecuador and we saw some tough situations and some really hopeless, hopeless moms. And I mean, perspective, it is just, it's given me such perspective to what children growing up in other parts of the world are experiencing, what mothers in other parts of the world are experiencing. So those were just very personal things for me mm-hmm. as a mother and for my child. And then just perspective in general. I mean, what's a better way? What's, well, what's the better way to say that? A more detailed I, way to well, say no, that? I, I loved what you said earlier about that this whole situation has taught you what it means to be part of the body of Christ. Yes. And so you're not only finding your place in the body of Christ, but you're finding the place of everyone else mm-hmm. in the world at that table. And that's that part of the language that we've used here is that that banquet table. What does it mean to, yes. to be part of the body of Christ? What does it mean to sit around the banquet table? What does it mean to see the people who are sitting across from you yes. at the banquet table? And I think that's the perspective that you're talking about. In thinking about just the, the relationships with us and our missionary partners, I, I come back to Yolanda. Like when our first Methodist a few years ago had our very first um, women's retreat, Yolanda came, Stefania from Romania came, Stefania was our speaker. Yolanda was there to pray with us, for us, over us. She also was there to participate. And it was an amazing experience. And especially with Yolanda's prayers and praying in Spanish. And for anybody who's never experienced either prayer in another language or sitting in a worship service in a language that you don't understand, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. When the Holy Spirit is truly there, and that's been our experience, it is, it's powerful. And so that's just been another great part. And then we had Costa Ricans come and help on a construction project here. You know, in Shreveport, which has been so, again, I think that's just that whole tangled web of what a great opportunity that God has shown us that we are all part of this family together. Mm -hmm. Together. Yeah. That will go down as one of my favorite uh, memories is Kay, Yolanda, Stefania, and I shared a cabin together. (laughs) And it was just the best. It was the best. It was just the best. It meant a lot to Yolanda to to have been invited and to get to be a part of that. And she still, she talks about it a lot. And, and we've talked a lot about figuring out a way to do something like that here in Costa Rica, but it would involve women from partner churches in the United States together with women from some of the churches that we're involved with here in Costa Rica, actually having that same kind of retreat experience here. So yes, um, I'm coming. Yeah, all of all great, but but those kinds of things. I mean, see how just how right that is. That an activity that your church put together, really for your church, has bled into the ministry that we've been called to here in Costa Rica. And that experience, because of our relationship with you, and because Yolanda was invited to be a part of that now is part of the things that God is doing through this ministry here in Costa Rica. And I just think that's that's the way it should be. That's so far removed from the mentality of you're coming to Costa Rica to build something for poor people that they can't build for themselves and then going home feeling better about yourself. Like that's just, that's a completely, we're so far away from that if these are the kinds of things that we're doing now, which is good. You know, we should feel good about that. Doesn't mean there's things that we can't do better doesn't mean that we can't stop trying to pay attention to how, you know, the spirit is growing us and moving us. But, but I do think there are things that we can look at and say, well, thank goodness we're not doing that. (laughs) Well, this was a good conversation. It was a good conversation. Thanks, Kay. Yeah. Thanks for, I was, you know, I, I feel like I was uh, had some big shoes to fill after all the missionaries and all the scholarly folks that have been on here, but I'm just honored. Do you want to tell them about the time? And uh, we were in Ecuador, and I had come back with Zika. I'm from not Italy. really. Okay. <laughs>
they don't want to hear about the time that almost killed you. <laughs> Try to and Ashley, you should do a spinoff podcast that's just about travel mishaps. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. I will say this, though. Near-death experiences. <laughs> Near-death experiences. Ashley's got some. I will say this, though. In, in, my, in my partnership and friendship with Ashley, you have pushed me in ways that I would have never pushed myself, like, into... I don't want to just use the word leadership, but that Ecuador trip, for example, Ashley did get sick and she had to send us ahead of her. And she just like hands me this folder. It's like, by the way, you're in charge until I get there. Um, I was terrified, but I it was great because it was hard, but it forced me like to to step up, mm -hmm. you know? And so, and we did it. And you did a great job. I mean, I, I and hey, learn some cultural things, you know, <laughs> without having someone there to guide me, we kind of messed up on, and you know, you know, just don't ever know what might be okay in this culture is not okay in another culture, but that's okay. We learned. Yes. And there was grace. There was grace and we got through it. Mm -hmm. And another great thing about relationship, you've built trust and you can, you can help each other through these things. So yeah, I feel. Um, so yeah, that's that's a, something that actually, and I'm sure you've done that for others. I feel like that's one of your gifts is kind of like just nudging people into like doing things we never thought we could do. Thanks, Kate. Yeah. Will have I ever done that for you? <laughs> have I pushed you to the brink of crazy? Yeah. Um, that's two different no. questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, then so, uh, <laughs> hey, or no, I, 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 I think, I mean, I think Ashley and I have a very easy relationship. I think from right off the bat, we kind of understood what made the other one tick. And, and so that's made it a very easy sort of partnership. You know, there, there are things that, I know are expected of me sort of technical things that are kind of expected of me, you know, like writing uh, something for columns at the church. He even did that, it a long time without being asked. Oh, I know. He just, yeah. Did it. Well, then so you, you know, it took 10 years of partnership, mm -hmm. but I finally learned what was expected of me. But, but no, I mean, I think honestly, for the, for the most part, that hasn't really been, I don't think, something I would use to characterize our relationship is that you, I feel like I've been pushed by you. That doesn't mean I haven't grown. I think those are different things. But anyway. You've caused me to grow, Will. Good. I feel like I've blossomed because of your friendship. I'm not sure I've ever been accused of making someone <laughs> blossom before. <laughs> or credited with. <laughs> well, well, Kay. This has been the best day ever. I just love you guys. Me too. Y'all make me feel good. <laughs> oh, good. That's that's good. That's good yeah. to hear. Yeah. Um, I think I'm coming to Shreveport in the fall, so I look forward to seeing you, Kay, yes. I hope, in yes, September. Absolutely. Is that right? Is that what we landed on? September, October? Sometime this fall. November, maybe? November. <laughs> November, whatever. Sometime <laughs> after July, I'll be in Shreveport and look forward to seeing you. Absolutely. Yeah. Ashley? It's been a pleasure. See you next time. Bye, Will. Bye, Ashley. Bye, Kay. Bye. You've been listening to The Broken Banquet, a podcast by Will Bailey and Ashley Goad. Music provided by Irene and the Sleepers. Join us next week for another episode. He's prepared the table. All things are ready. Come to the feast. <laughs>